Since the 1960s, British state forces are confirmed to have infiltrated over a thousand groups in the UK in one form or another. On the 13th of February 2019, The Guardian released a database list of 124 of these groups, which included environmentalists, animal rights groups, anti-racism groups, Irish liberation support groups, anti-war groups, and all manner of progressive and civil rights focused organisations. Most prominently, it was revealed that dozens of undercover police officers had infiltrated the Trotskyist Socialist Workers' Party, many using the names and stealing the identities of dead children. Four of them deceived women into sexual relationships while using their fake identities. One boy met one of his wives during his deployment and had a child with her. These weren't acts that arose spontaneously from the minds of local police officers either, but were directed by British state intelligence agencies. MI5 Security Service told police in 1973 that spying on the Socialist Workers' Party was one of its primary aims, and asked that undercover police infiltrate its headquarters. The police were able to meet MI5's request to have a quote, permanent well-placed spy there, and numerous more, it would appear, down the years. Across the pond, as they say, state attacks on socialist organising in the 1930s and the 1950s are well known and widely publicised, as are operations like the FBI's COINTELPRO. We've all heard of the Black Panther Party and the sabotage, the agent provocateurs, the manipulative spreading of misinformation that caused division, and ultimately the lethal force to which this organisation and its supporters were subjected, including the brutal assassination of Fred Hampton and countless other heroic fighters for black national liberation. What's somewhat less known is how the FBI would infiltrate the 1960s progressive students organisation Students for Democratic Society infiltrating and actively working to aggravate and sow division within using a plethora of tactics, to the end of fulfilling the proposal of neutralising the new left and the key activists approved by J. Edgar Hoover. From the Students for Democratic Society emerged the Marxism-Leninism Mao Zedong taught oriented grouping, the Revolutionary Union, which would later develop into the Revolutionary Communist Party USA. From the very beginning of the Revolutionary Union, prior to the establishment of the Revolutionary Communist Party itself, the Revolutionary Union had already been thoroughly infiltrated by state forces. Aaron J. Leonard and Connor A. Gallagher in the book Heavy Radicals, The FBI's Secret War on America's Maoists wrote that, the fact that the FBI had two high-level informants in the Revolutionary Union from its beginnings is established as is the fact that they had an informant in the Chicago Revolutionary Union, this too from its very beginnings. And now it's also clear that by the early 70s, they had an informant whose identity might overlap the above on the Central Committee. So these state infiltrators weren't simply rank and file members of the organisation, these were high ranked organisers and in at least one confirmed case, part of the top leadership in the organisation's Central Committee itself. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, okay, that happened in the past, but it probably doesn't happen anymore. Or you may think to yourself, well, I don't live in Britain or the USA, so this isn't really something that concerns me. <sighs> My sweet summer child. It's recently been reported here in Ireland that an MI5 agent named Dennis McFadden infiltrated the revolutionary Republican organisation known as the New Irish Republican Army in its early days of 2012, right up until August 2020, when numerous alleged members of the organisation's alleged leadership were arrested from a sting operation organised by McFadden. Dennis McFadden, it's reported, quickly rose up through the organisational ranks once again repeating the pattern of an imperialist state agent infiltrating the highest levels of a revolutionary organisation. McFadden rented out a couple of houses in County Tyrone to be used as safe houses for alleged army council meetings between February and July 2020. Prior to the participants' arrival, McFadden had arranged for other members of MI5 to enter the houses and bug every room with high-tech hidden audio and camera recording equipment. McFadden then brought the alleged organisational leadership to these houses where they were allegedly recorded discussing organisational activity and this would lead to 10 arrests in August 2020. The words alleged and allegedly here relating to the 10 arrested aren't just being used for legal cover. 
There's good reason to be suspicious about the claims against the 10 people arrested, given that on the 23rd of September, just this past week, it was revealed in a court hearing that MI5 had deleted all of the master tapes related to this sting. Now, why would the agency do that? In any case, this demonstrates that state infiltration and sabotage is still a pressing issue today, using all of the same old tactics, alongside utilising far more sophisticated and advanced methods based on numerous decades of experience, as well as significant technological developments. You, viewer or listener, are not immune to this, regardless of whether you're a revolutionary or a reformist, a Malcolm X or a Martin Luther King Jr. You don't exist outside of their reach. None of us do. Even if, as the list of 124 organisations mentioned earlier shows, you're just involved in the most milquetoast, progressive, centre-left activism. And more than that, even if you're not actually in any organisation, but just in spaces such as these, like left YouTube, left Twitter and so on, you've likely encountered these issues yourself before without even realising. So today we're going to talk about the implications of efforts such as these, things that need to be looked out for, and how we can best guard ourselves and our movements to avoid being infiltrated, manipulated, and ultimately sabotaged. Speaking of the nefarious role of state forces against left-wing activists, before we go any further, an important message from today's sponsor, leftwingbooks.net. Kevin Rashid Johnson is the Minister of Defence for the Revolutionary Intercommunal Black Panther Party. He's currently a political prisoner in the Virginia Department of Corrections. Unfortunately, Rashid has recently tested positive for a serious form of cancer. Cancer can progress quickly and Rashid isn't being given appropriate medical treatment to prevent the cancer from spreading to his lymph nodes, at which point it'll be fatal. He's already faced needless major delays in getting the cancer diagnosis itself. After having taken tests in October and November 2021, which indicated cancer almost certainly, no biopsy was performed until April, and the positive results of the biopsies weren't reported to Rashid until the 1st of July 2022. On top of his health conditions and medical neglect, Rashid was recently transferred from Nottoway Correctional Center to Sussex One State Prison in Virginia on September 23rd, where he's currently in solitary confinement with limited communication. To support Rashid and ensure he receives proper medical treatment, it's urgent for all of us to contact the offices of Sussex One State Prison and the Virginia Department of Corrections. Check the pinned comment below this video for more details on contact information, including a transcript to read when you call these offices. Be sure to follow along on updates on his website, rashidmod.com, and follow him on Twitter and Instagram at rashidmod2. We need to demand appropriate and immediate treatment to protect Rashid's life. After demanding appropriate treatment for Rashid, another way of supporting him is by purchasing his insightful revolutionary writings published by Kerslevadeb, such as Defying the Tomb, Selected Prison Writings and Art of Kevin Rashid Johnson featuring exchanges with an outlaw, Panther Vision, and On the Vanguard Once Again, each an excellent text that you're certain to learn a lot from. These are available on leftwingbooks.net, a radical left-wing distributor based in Montreal where you can find Chris Plebedev's publications like Rashid's writings and more, which you'll find linked in the description box below. Use the coupon code, you're gonna love this, Burn the Prisons for a 20% discount on all Chris Plebedev publications, which further stacks on top of any other sale prices currently on the different texts available. This applies not only to Rashid's writings, but to all Chris Plebedev publications, including works by James Yaki Sales, Joshua Mouthwood Paul, Bush Lee, and many more great revolutionary Marxist and anarchist writers. So now's your chance to stock up. Free shipping is available on all North American orders over $50, and inexpensive shipping is also available on all Chris Plebedev publications in Europe. Support Rashid by contacting the Virginia authorities today and demanding he receives appropriate cancer treatment immediately. Then head over to leftwingbooks.net to grab a copy of his books using the 20% off coupon code Burn the Prisons. Make sure to get in there as soon as possible as this code expires on the 14th of October. A massive thanks to leftwingbooks.net for sponsoring this video and making its production possible as well as for supporting Comrade Rashid and for helping to spread the revolutionary message through their work. And now, back to the video. Now, we've spoken a bit about some examples of infiltration and sabotage of left-wing movements by US and British imperialist state forces over the decades and right up to today. 
And the reason we did this is that there can be a certain level of naivety among those who are new to the left, who assume that things like that happen to other people, but that it would never happen to them. And that's just not true. Each one of us needs to be educated and educating others around us in the history of state infiltration and sabotage of progressive movements. The purpose of this is not to cause paranoia or distrust. The purpose is to learn to identify the warning signs so that we can limit the damage it causes. So we need to take a look at some of the main strategies and tactics used by these infiltrators and wreckers. Let's take a look now at how they might behave in organisations themselves. In a 1944 document from the OSS, which would become the CIA after the Second World War, titled Simple Sabotage Field Manual, which was declassified in 2008, eight pieces of advice were outlined for those who wished to sabotage organisations, specifically those who wanted to slow down or halt progress. They were as follows. 1. Insist on doing everything through, quote, channels. Never permit shortcuts to be taken in order to expedite decisions. 2. Make, quote, speeches. Talk as frequently as possible and at great length. Illustrate your, quote, points by long anecdotes and accounts of personal experiences. Never hesitate to make a few appropriate, quote, patriotic comments. 3. When possible, refer all matters to committees for, quote, further study and consideration. Attempt to make the committees as large as possible, never less than five. 4. Bring up irrelevant issues as frequently as possible. 5. Haggle over precise wordings of communications, minutes, resolutions. 6. Refer back to matters decided upon at the last meeting and attempt to reopen the question of the advisability of that decision. 7. Advocate, quote, caution. Be, quote, reasonable and urge your fellow conferees to be reasonable and avoid haste which might result in embarrassments or difficulties later on. 8. Be worried about the propriety of any decision. Raise the question of whether such action as is contemplated lies within the jurisdiction of the group or whether it might conflict with the policy of some higher echelon. Now it's worth reminding ourselves that each one of these could be happening by genuine good faith organisational members. And it's also worth considering the possibility that this document itself was leaked in order to throw activists off the trail of actual infiltrators. It's impossible to know for sure. But it can certainly be seen that these actions would have the potential to severely slow down or even grind to a halt any kind of serious organisational progress that might be necessary particularly in a revolutionary context. And those regularly engaged in this activity should be kept an eye on. It's easy to imagine how these eight points, if used in, for example, a one hour long organisational meeting, could effectively prevent anything from getting done. Beyond these eight points, as we've seen too, infiltrators will try to rise to positions of power and prominence so as to steer movements in particular directions, either to the right or to the left, depending on which path makes neutralisation of that particular movement easier. They'll also do this to gain access to detailed information on everyone involved in the organisation and then pass that information on to the state. Infiltrators often emerge suddenly out of nowhere, attempting to become everyone's best friend and quickly trying to create false senses of familiarity and shared history. They're quickly able to elevate their standing within movements, often being highly educated in the relevant theory and history by their state agency, which makes them appear to be sincere, dedicated, committed activists. An internal FBI document from 1973 details this process of actively educating informants to high levels so that they're able to penetrate the leadership of revolutionary organisations. At the FBI conference relating to the Revolutionary Union and pro-Chinese communist matters held in San Francisco January 22nd to 23rd 1973, it was recommended that the study paper, Summary of Radical Political Thought, be updated, revised as necessary, and thereafter be disseminated to all offices involved in this investigation. The paper will be used to indoctrinate special agents in the fundamentals of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, looking to development of quality informants who may be targeted to penetrate domestic pro-Chinese communist groups at a leadership level. Note the specific targeting of anti-revisionist, Marxist-Leninist-Maoist-oriented revolutionary groups. That's not an accident. 
Another common tactic of infiltrators is that they'll often try to play up antagonisms within movements, causing unnecessary division with the goal of causing needless splits. This may be around taking up various controversial positions, it may be playing up interpersonal disputes, it may be, ironically, fed jacketing others by accusing them of being informants, take a moment to process that one, or it may be focused on pushing unprincipled political division, pushing for extremes in either right-wing or ultra-left directions. The purpose of all this is to create artificial splits, sow confusion and otherwise defang a revolutionary movement. In some cases, infiltrators will be instructed to enter revolutionary organisations and to push them towards reformism and revisionism, often being directed by state agents to vote in specific ways on particular matters, slowly, subtly undermining the revolutionary aspects and pushing the movement into the safe confines of bourgeois parliamentary activity. This has long been suspected of certain former Irish Republican groups who started off as principled revolutionaries engaged in struggle for the 32 county People's Irish Republic proclaimed in 1916, but over a period of time abandoned the revolutionary Republican struggle and ended up becoming mainstream centrist reformists. This too was part of the FBI's strategy against the Revolutionary Union to push them from a revolutionary anti-revisionist line to a rightist revisionist line by, interestingly, manipulating their own writings. In an FBI internal communication, they wrote that We can slightly alter Revolutionary Union publications, have them reproduced by the laboratory and distributed in great numbers to Marxist, black militants, students for democratic society, left publications, etc. throughout the country. By altering the publications, we can distort the political line of the Revolutionary Union. In fact, turn it into a revisionist line in a subtle manner. So this tactic of state forces actively attempting to push an organisation from a revolutionary anti-revisionist line to a reformist revisionist line has been put into practice in many parts of the world. This may perhaps appear understandable to some, apparently suggesting state forces simply want to de-escalate and avoid revolutionary violence, instead offering the revisionist peaceful road to socialism or national liberation. However, this is contradicted by the fact that infiltrators will instead sometimes be instructed to push organisations toward ultra-left adventurism and even encourage terrorism. In another FBI internal communication, this time about the Students for Democratic Society, they boasted that the National Office Fraction is gradually being forced into a position of militant extremism which hopefully will isolate it from other elements of the libertarian community and eventuate its complete discrediting in the eyes of the American public. The FBI was more than happy to encourage the rise of extremism in the movement as they knew that this would function as a form of sabotage that would isolate the movement from many of its supporters, causing it to become discredited. Not only that, by groups moving towards adventurism and terror tactics, this would give state forces the green light to kill those involved, or at very least, to lock them up and get them out of the movement. In that sense, the adventurists became in many ways much easier to neutralise than those who took a longer view with regard to the development of the revolutionary process. So any and every form of sabotage imaginable, and probably a lot more beyond that, is on the cards for state forces. And from looking at this history and present, it'd be incredibly naive for us to assume that such forces aren't actively working to manipulate and sabotage our movements today. Not only in our organisations, but also right here on social media. Consider the supposed socialist influencers who unironically support NATO, or who claim that communists don't seek to abolish private property. These people who are raising the red flag in order to bring down the red flag. Sounds a lot like the FBI's plan to subtly distort the line of the Revolutionary Union and turn it into a revisionist line, doesn't it? But here's the kicker. These people themselves as individuals may or may not be conscious professional infiltrators or saboteurs who've been openly funded by state agencies. 
With social media and with platforms like Patreon and other forms of anonymous donation or tipping services, it's incredibly easy to financially support people who are objectively supporting imperialism without these people even realising who's enabling them. It's also very easy for anonymous individuals, including state agents, to get close to such so-called influencers online through platforms like Discord or Twitter DMs, putting certain ideas in influencers' minds, planting seeds and pushing them in particular ideological directions. Which of course will then be broadcasted to their hundreds of thousands if not millions of followers. In fact, it would be incredibly easy for a state agency to develop an influencer into a saboteur, unbeknownst to them, in every practical way imaginable, including subtly educating them and encouraging them to say certain things by whispering this or that in their ears, as well as providing them full financial support to continue doing what they're doing via Patreon or donations on YouTube, Twitch, etc. And again, this could happen completely anonymously, unknown to the influencers themselves. And when that's an option on the menu to these state agencies today, agencies who've shown themselves to be willing to do everything up to and including committing literal assassinations of their political enemies, well, a person would have to be extremely naive to imagine that this isn't happening to one degree or another today. But whether these influencers are consciously acting as wreckers or unconsciously being utilised as useful idiots ultimately doesn't matter. In the end, they're objectively serving the very same role as part of the imperialist bourgeoisie's ideological state apparatus of protecting and reinforcing the current relations of production, the current system of capitalism imperialism. So, make sure to always stay vigilant both online and offline. Take operational security seriously, this isn't a joke. And within offline revolutionary organising, practice concentric construction of the movement to provide the best possible protection against infiltration, manipulation and sabotage. Right, thanks very much for watching this video. This is of course just the tip of the iceberg, but hopefully you found it useful in one way or another. If you're interested in looking into this matter deeper, a few of us are going to be exploring the book Heavy Radicals on the Politics in Command podcast in a lot more depth soon. Politics in Command, or Polycom, is an excellent new anti-revisionist revolutionary podcast that's officially launching tomorrow on the 1st of October. This is to commemorate the anniversary of the Chinese Revolution with an episode featuring not only Comrade Rashid mentioned earlier, but also some other great familiar guests that I know a lot of viewers of this particular channel will be excited to hear from. I've personally had the opportunity to listen to a couple of episodes in advance and all I can say is get hyped because you're in for something really, really special. Welcome to Politics in Command, a new podcast based in anti-revisionist politics. And it just completely reaffirmed, you know, the potential that uh, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism has um, in a revolution. It is really, really hard, even when you have a party that is committed to making these types of changes. When your whole society is designed and geared towards making these changes, how hard it is to get rid of oppression rooted from past societies. You know, in, in 1909, Kolontai said that the woman question is not separate from the general social question. And you see that here in how these women viewed their own emancipation, both from the bondage of capitalist society, but also from the bondage of patriarchal feudalism. China has been producing billionaires very fast, you know, um, every, every year. But overall, I don't think there is a clear sign that the, the government were, you know, somehow pro, pro labor, pro worker. I don't think so. First off, we refer to the occupied part of our country as the occupied six counties. We don't use the phrase that imperialism gives it for the simple reason that we believe to use that phrase is to uh, give legitimacy on an artificial and illegal stateless win in Ireland. Well, fascism is essentially the consolidation of state power and corporate power to the extent that the state becomes the primary sustainer of corporate power and the protector of corporate power. And the way I think about philosophy, I think about it 
as an operation upon a given theoretical terrain that attempts to provide clarity to the meaning of this terrain. Without the transformation of society, without land reforms, without defense of liberated areas against nationalist armies, it was impossible to talk of liberation for women. You know, it's a vice versa, it's a dialectical relationship. Listen to the new anti-revisionist revolutionary podcast drop in on October 1st. Listen on all major podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google, and more. Stay up to date on social media. Twitter handle is at Polycom and Instagram at Politics and Command. And be sure to check out our website, politicsandcommand.info. All the links to the new podcast can be found in the description box below. Special thanks to Jay for editing this video, and as always to the supporters on Patreon who continue to make each of these videos possible with their generous donations. Thank you Blue Collar Red, Julia Affentranger, Eric Graham McEachern, BJB7, Gato Ansok, Vangelo, Jolie, Ugopnik, Brimwater, Ryan Hodgson, Soup, Michaela Schmidt, Christian Napales, Alfonso Dingo Torres, Rock Gardist, Zakasi, Anglo Irish Bolshevik, Thomas Rossin Wood, Bobby Block, Jason Schmidt, Mitch Schiller, Sirshini Vialin, Roja, MLM in Practice, Eric Lindahl, Robert Jarzak, Anastasia, Wonderbad, JD Chapman, Joseph Shepard, Comrade Amara, Wealth for the 99%, Peter Krauss, Hagen Mitchells, Carlos De Luna, 23 Skidoo, John Purser, Rodrigo Pichardo, Chairman Bro, Fauci Fuga, Tears Cadigan, Brian Lounge, Sexy Socialist, Catrist Maoist, Noel Hemdal, Richard Scott Wigton, Connor L, and Chairman Eris. Cheers everyone, I'll get